She was offered her dream job and she turned it down. You're going to learn why. What's up, Active Lifers? Welcome back to the Active Life Podcast. I'm Dr. Sean Pastuch and I'm your host. Today's guest is Wheezy Shoemaker. She's an ALP candidate who's been working with Active Life for the last two months or so. And within her first six weeks as an ALP candidate, she got scouted and offered a job working at one of the most premier businesses in her area. She decided not to take the job. In this podcast, we're going to dive into Wheezy's core values, what Wheezy's learned in the last two months working with Active Life, what it was like to get offered such an intensely desirable job so quickly into her career as an Active Life professional candidate, why she decided to enroll, what the objections she had before enrolling were, how she helped herself overcome them, and what she would recommend to somebody who's on the fence about enrolling with Active Life is. I was very clear with Wheezy before we started this podcast. This podcast should be about you, not about Active Life. So if you think you're in for a pitch session, you're not. You're not. Uh, I think Wheezy had a really unique story and I wanted to help her share it. And I wanted to help you get to hear it. So with no further ado, let's get you to the podcast. Oh, wait, a little, just a, just a little further ado. Remember, share it with a friend. You can read it too. Now let's get you to Wheezy. Wheezy Shoemaker, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Yeah. I've just put a poll into my Instagram story and you voted in it and I want to get your take on something. Okay. For people who are not looking at my Instagram account in real time, because let's be honest, like we can't, it's not real time. <laughs> um, the poll is, I took an image of a Ferrari that was on carguru.com that cost $628,000. And mm -hmm. I edited the image to be $30,000. Right. And I posted a top and bottom comparison where it says top one is $628,000 or $648,000. Bottom one is $30,000. Everything about them is the same otherwise. I duplicated the image with all the descriptions, right? Right. And then I put a poll in that said, which one would you prefer? Like, which one would you rather have? Which one do you want? I forget which, what the exact verbiage was. About 60% of people right now are saying they would like the $648,000 one. About 40%. Who isn't saying that? What? That's the reaction I was looking for. No. What, so, so the question is, why would, why would anybody prefer the $30,000 version? What do you think the answer is? Because I've obviously reached out and asked them. Well, if they're only voting with their dollar, then, yeah, sure, I'd like to spend $30 on a Ferrari. However, or $30,000, but the first thing that comes to mind is, is it to scale? Like, are we talking about the toy version of, Mm -hmm. the $648,000 one, or what is wrong with it? Like who died in this vehicle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I asked all of them, why would you rather the $30,000 one? Only one person gave me an answer where I was like, oh, okay. I see you. And they said, so what was the answer? The answer was because if it's truly the same car, and I trust you, so I would trust that you wouldn't do, you wouldn't lie to me. I can resell the thirty thousand dollar car for somewhere near six hundred forty eight thousand dollars <laughs> and make the gap. I said, right, but you have to keep it. And they said, oh, well, then I would the six forty eight. The reason I bring that up is, I want you to talk about why you would prefer the six forty eight. What is it about a car that's more expensive that makes it seem like the car that you would want? Mm. Um, I feel like maybe I'm uniquely equipped to answer this because several years ago we bought a Tesla over something like a Nissan Leaf. Mm -hmm. um, both can get you from point A to point B. Both do not take gas. Mm -hmm. Both have pretty robust infotainment systems and enough cargo space and all that. 
uh, but the one feels different. What feels different? Um, you feel like you are getting a better experience from really like the first time that you reach out the, the difference in the white glove treatment of getting a Tesla then rolling up to my local Nissan and Greg greets me. Why does it, why, um, why does it matter? The, why does the buying experience matter if once the buying experience is over, you're going to have that car and it's yours? Well, because it matters how you feel about something before you are actually in it at all. Like the perception matters and it's, it's, people want to feel a certain way about their purchases. And I also trust that, or at least at the time, you know, this was a few years ago, but that the Tesla was going to be better for us in the long run because it had a more robust support network, a better supercharger network, uh, a longer range, and had been more tested mm -hmm. at the point. So even though we could have bought the cheaper option, I want to go with the one that is going to guarantee me the feeling that I think I may have. Well, so the reason I'm asking you this is obviously, well, obvious to you, probably not to somebody listening because we haven't even talked about who you are yet, <laughs> but it's because I'm fascinated by the psychology of why people decide to do things or not to do things. And right. in the fitness space, especially what we often see is the person who wants to buy looking for the best mm -hmm. and the person who wants to sell pricing at a point that they think would attract somebody to buy. Right. Where it's affordable, right? But right. they're effectively talking past each other because the person who wants to buy isn't looking at price if they have a real problem that they want to have solved. When it comes down to it, sure. At the end, you have to have the money to do the thing. But the person who is selling oftentimes is looking for what's the least I can possibly charge for this so that the most people can possibly buy it. And we're not like that at all. And you're not like that, from what I understand at least. And so I'm curious okay. where, where that comes from for you. What makes you decide, like, what makes you decide to spend an amount of money on something that is more than the alternative besides a car. Like for example, you enrolled in ALP. Let's, let's use you as a real example. Mm -hmm. When I first talked to you about enrolling in ALP, you have a fairly new baby at the house. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm battling a little bit of a cough. So I know anybody I can, watching, I, I can tell if I, if I mute and you see me like, yeah. <laughs> so hence the new baby. Hence how, the new baby. how old is the baby? Four months now. Okay. So you have a four month old. When, when we first talked, I think maybe she was what, like a month or he was a month. Yeah. He was only, I think six weeks old when I first reached out. Right. Um, and at the time you told me there's some things I want to do. And I think mm -hmm. active life is in my future, maybe a year out from now. Mm -hmm. You end up enrolling like four days later with somebody else. I'm exaggerating. I think it was like a month later. What made no, you, I think it was close to four days. It might have been. <laughs> what made you decide to to enroll so quickly? It wasn't that the price came down. There was no promo that came out. There was no offer. Right. Um, so I enrolled in the boot camp. Mm -hmm. um, that was what happened in between first speaking to you and signing up. And it became very apparent to me very, very quickly that ALP was not just another cert I was going to hang on my wall and, you know, put in my Instagram bio. This is a robust skill set evolution, not just down to let me grow my craft as a coach to do the types of things that I'm interested and passionate in, but also... I don't really think that anybody who's in fitness full time got into it because they're really passionate about like crunching the numbers mm -hmm. or about marketing as a career. But those are things that if you want to be a professional coach, you have to have 
knowledge around that. If you want to grow and you want to make the type of money that you deserve to deliver a premium product, you need to have those skills. And it became really quickly to me through the boot camp that, oh, this is this is going to be different if I go this route. This is not me signing up for another weekend cert or a six week self paced thing. I am going to be tested to grow, not just as a coach, but as a business owner. Why was that important to you though? You had a job you worked in, like if you would share with me, what, what did you, what did you do or what at the big box gym where you were? Um, so I was teaching uh, functional fitness style classes. Okay. So not CrossFit, but functional fitness style classes in the big box environment. So you ha so you have a job. You have a yep. new baby. Yep. You're married. Your husband yeah. your husband has a job? He sure does. Why change anything? Um, because I was tired of feeling like I can help somebody modify around something. Um I can give you a sub for a movement all day, or I can point out, Hey, here on your body is where this is ailing you. We can, we can absolutely work around this and let's, you know, I can recommend some things to help you maybe guess at healing this thing. But I was tired after almost eight years of helping people work around pain and was starting to feel the tap on my shoulder of, no, 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 no. We can fix this, and I can be the person to help you do it. I don't want to be necessarily referring you out to a physical therapist or to a chiropractor when I don't think that's actually what you need. Um, I want to have those people in my, in my network and in my toolkit, and I had already done a pretty good job of establishing um, – a line of communication with professionals in the area, but I was sick of this person is not sick enough for the medical complex. And yet here I am, and I just don't have the tools to actually help them. And that became more and more and more infuriating to me. Did we teach that in the boot camp you took with us though? Well, I had a, I had a discovery call. Okay. So you knew that that was something that we did. Right. Okay. So I knew, I knew that that was something that you did um, because I have been friends with Nick Mula for a long time. Mm. Um, he and I go back to when he still lived in Nashville. Um, and I lived there at the time as well. You're in Columbus. And so now, yeah. I, I am in Columbus and now. Nick's, and Nick's right. in Durham. That's right. Neither of us are where we started. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was aware of active life because of him. And so knew kind of, hey, this is possible. Um, and then through enrolling in the boot camp, it became clear to me, okay, this is not just going to put another tool in my tool belt of, great, you're going to be able to assess with better precision and um, really solve valuable problems. Um, but it's going to help you in this other way that you have never addressed before at all. So... What I find fascinating about what you just said is I have trouble talking about that publicly. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> I think that I struggle to message that in a way that celebrates the coach for what they're able to do today. Right. And still obviates there's stuff that you just haven't been taught how to do. Right. And right. even if you took a NASM corrective exercise specialist, it's that that's like a temporary tattoo compared to a full back piece. Right. Um, and and it, being the best scaler in the world, best modifier in the world, that's not what we're talking about here. So how did it, how does it pierce through for you? How, for, I guess the better question is how did you feel on a day in and day out about being able to modify with the best of them, but not being able to fix it. Like what did that, what was that like inside for you? Gross. Um, it just, it, it started as a whisper and then grew to like 
intolerable of this person is still dealing with this thing. We've been working out together three or four days a week for two years. And this thing is still a problem. I know it's fixable. They're not getting the help that they need from the medical model that I don't necessarily even know is appropriate, but I can't help them. I don't have the tools. You realize there's a level of audacity that you have to have to believe that you're the person you should help them, right? Oh, yes. I have a great deal of audacity. <laughs> How do you, so you say that with a lot of confidence. How do you know you have audacity? <laughs> um, my husband tells me a great deal. <laughs> is, he, is, he, is he a quiet type? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very calculated. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I find that fascinating, by the way. My wife is the same. She's the quiet type. She's the one everybody loves super easy. She's extremely right. trustworthy. You know she's always got your best interests in mind. Yeah. And then there's me. And, I, <laughs> I, and you know, I, I used to get in trouble for being naked at parties. Like, that. we're, we're just not <laughs> the same person. <laughs> no. My, my husband, um, my mother-in-law will tell you, to this day was a perfect child from birth to now has has done no wrong could do no wrong um was her angel baby i bet that and my my brother-in-law who is uh ted's older brother was not that way mm -hmm. he she will tell you to your face he was awful from day one how does how does, how does it go in your marriage where your mother-in-law thinks that your husband can do no wrong at all and you know like look He's great. All right. I love your son, but let's not put it, him so high. On the um, it creates no problems at all. What That's, do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was a mama's boy growing up. I think generally speaking, my mom would say that I, I, I could only do some wrong. And it was, it was the kind of wrong that she enjoyed, mm. if that makes any sense. Mm, sure. uh, and it took me a while, frankly, to figure out how to balance a wife and a mother. Yeah. It, it, it's, yes. It's a skill set. Yeah. It took him a little while as well, mm -hmm. but um, we've both settled into our roles, I think, pretty well. That's good. What made you want to go back to work so quickly after having a baby? I mean, six weeks. That's quick. Um, so I didn't actually go back. I mean, like, it makes a huge difference, but I didn't start coaching until about the 10 week point. Okay. Um, but I was restlessly waiting to go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I was, I was ready. I think it's different, a little different second kiddo. Oh, it's your second um, one. Yes. How so old? we have a, we have, we have a four year old named Walt okay. and then little man is named Jack. Okay. So I imagine if your husband was the one having the baby, he'd be much happier staying home, but you're like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm back at it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, for us, it's the opposite, which works out. Okay. So you decide to enroll in the education. You start using it with your clients. First things I want to know is, I mean, I, I want to learn more about you, but I, I also want to stay on this thread for a second. Are you feeling like you've been in it now, what, two months? Um, roughly, yes. Are you at all, like, are you at all better yet at being able to solve for those problems? That's, that's early in the education. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm better at being able to solve the problems, but I am much better at communicating with the people whose problems I can solve now mm -hmm. and advocating for that skill set and able to sell something that previously I would not have been able to sell. Is that what gives you the confidence that you're going to get the rest in time? Oh yeah, no question. Because I'm always curious about that, too. Like, you're, you're in, but you're not getting what we promised yet. We can't give it yeah. to you. Like, there's a, there's, there's a time, there's like a, there's, right. a, there's an order of operations here. Uh, and yet, people stick with it. And I love to hear it. And so, so, so you're saying that it's your ability to acquire clients now that you didn't have before that, that makes it so that you have confidence you're going to get the rest in the long term. Yes. Okay. There's no doubt in my mind. And an unexpected value, I think, because when you enrolled, we weren't even really talking about this, is people started coming at you for hiring, yes? That is correct. What was that like? I mean, I just had someone in my office earlier today 
who was just in for some mentorship. He's a local guy. He wants to make it in the fitness industry. And he's like, look, you, you seem like you're the guy. But I don't understand how anybody can make a career in the fitness industry. And I, I was just like, look, it's, it's not only possible, it's probable. Right. And it's simple, but it's not easy. Right. So what was it like when people started coming at you for hiring and they were like looking to offer you real positions? Um, it felt a little bit like holding a stack deck. What does that mean? Um, because I already had a job mm -hmm. and then I had the ability and knowing I'm, I am growing my toolkit and I have basically unlimited potential that's just going to take a little bit of time mm -hmm. to build. And then another opportunity that who's to say that it's potentially a better fit or not, but another opportunity based on the tools that I didn't even have yet. Well, I, I, what I think is super cool about the way that you went about the whole thing is you, you basically interviewed them. Once, once they had made the yeah. offer to you, you were like, let me just see what this would be like and decided that, look, right. as, as appealing as this offer is, it's not the right, it's not the right location. It's not the right time. And I appreciate the, the courtesy and everything parted yeah. amicably. Yes. What would you be looking for in an employer? Like what, like, would... like what, what is the job offer that Wheezy Shoemaker could never turn down? Um, something that gives me as much or more flexibility and alignment with my values mm -hmm. and money than I am currently capable of building on my own. I like that you added money in there because I think a lot of the time people neglect it. You mentioned- No, it's important. I, I, need to, I need to make the kind of money that I can make doing it on my own to how consider much, it. How much money do you need to make? Um, I would need it to be in the $80,000 range to say, yep, all in with you. Is that because you feel confident that you can exceed that on your own? Yes. So why would you ever take a job? If you, like, in other words, if you're confident that you can get between, let's just say, eighty and $150,000 a year. Mm -hmm. If you're confident that you can do that on your own, why would you ever take a job? What's the, what's the value of that? Um, I think the only reason to potentially do that over build it on your own is if you feel fatigued by the perils of business ownership. Mm -hmm. If you want to be the member of the team rather than the person behind the spreadsheets. And if you, if you were to lean one way or the other, which one do you think you're more of? Assuming the pay um, was the same. Imagine the pay was the same. And it doesn't have to be a spreadsheet, right? It's either you're, mm -hmm. you're either a member of an A team mm -hmm. or you're the leader of an A team. And the pay is the well, same. Well, I, I think there's an important question there, which is how open to both feedback and autonomy of work does the ownership have? Yeah, they have to both be the best case scenario. Hmm. Well then in that instance, I think I go more towards wanting to work in a team. I like a collaborative approach, mm -hmm. but if I don't have, um, if there's not somewhat of a democracy where anybody's ideas can be brought to the table and valued and considered, and also autonomy of how I program for and serve my clients, um, it would be an absolute no for me. The interesting part of that sentence was somewhat of, because I was in a conversation today with uh, Mary, our chief strategy officer and Nick, who's our uh, lead sales team member, our VP of sales. And I was explaining, I believe we need less democracy and more dictatorship mm. in, in, in the realm of direction, not in the realm I, of, of execution I agree with that. or how or any of that. Right. 
and I'm not saying that you and I are saying anything different, by the way. Sure. Right. Because sure. because we got to the point that I think we almost um, we get too little done because too many people have a voice mm-hmm. that has the ability mm-hmm. to slow something down that leads us to just talking and talking and talking and talking and then, sure and then nothing happens right and and that's not the culture of our company in general but there are instances in which that's the case and so mm-hmm. what is the right amount as someone who would be an employee what is the right amount of democracy and how much do you want someone to just tell you this is how we do it mm. i don't think i mind being told this is how we do it as long as it's in alignment with what i believe to be the right thing to do. So you, you've now gone back to values two or three times. Do you have personal core values? I do. You smiled like you think I knew that. I didn't know that. I was, I was, <laughs> I was genuinely curious. What, what are they? Um, I believe in being curious. I believe in being compassionate. I believe in being professional. So curiosity, professionalism, and compassion. Mm-hmm. How did you come up with those? <laughs> um, it's actually a part of the uh, 100s mm. of AOP. You know, but I already had a pretty good. Um, it helped me scope them out with what does that exactly mean. But um, those are values that I have held myself to for a long time. The thing I'm finding funny about that is the smile that you presented to me either said you know this is in your education. Or it said, <laughs> I learned this in your education. <laughs> my, my, my involvement in that stuff is high level in the sure. way of these people who are going through the course need the following. They need to be able to make enough money to have financial freedom. They need to be able to deliver results to clients that are fulfilling for them, that they feel confident they can right. promise every single time. And they need to know who they are. That means they need to have a mission. They need to have a vision for their life. And they need to have core values that they're going to adhere to in order to achieve that mission and vision. Mm -hmm. Until you said that, I didn't know when we teach it, how we teach it, where we teach any of that. Right. I didn't know it was, I knew we talked about them in the 100s, but I didn't know that you were setting them. What was it like for you to crystallize what your core values are? Has that affected your personal life at all? I think that it helped a great deal at deciding that the offers on the table were not a good fit. Okay. So, yes. Is, is that because you didn't feel like you were able to be curious? Or you were able that, or that, that there was enough compassion or that there was enough, like, was one of them missing? Yeah, for me, there was some curiosity missing. Okay. Um, and there was some professionalism missing. And so it was out of alignment with the values that at this point in my career, I feel are the most important when I'm considering a change. Do you ever wonder, um, I'm going to ask you this question and it will come across as though potentially I am gaslighting you. And I am not. Okay. I am asking you this question strictly <laughs> because I want to get inside of your mind. Okay. Do you ever wonder if it's you? In other words, do you ever wonder if oh, you're all like, the time. what do you do about that? And then, the, by the way, um, to, this is this is a selfish question for me to ask because I look around and I see a lot of businesses who are mm-hmm. acquiring clients like you very mm. differently than we do at Active Life. Very mm. differently. They're promising you're going to make all this money. You're going to make it so fast. You're gonna, we're going to give you the funnels. We're going to give you the lead acquisition. We're going to teach you how to retain the clients. We're like, we're going to help you become a better person. And we think as a result of that, you're going to make a bunch of money. Right. right? <laughs> and, and because you're becoming a better person, you're also <laughs> going to develop a set of skills that's going to allow you to be more valuable to other people. We are personal development disguised as business. And as fitness. And I don't feel ethical speaking about what we do the same way that anybody who would say that they are a competitor of us speaks about what they do. And I can't imagine how somebody goes to bed at night 
talking about what they do for clients the way that I see other people in our space talking about what they do for clients. And I can't see any coaches putting themselves to bed at night thinking that they're doing the kinds of things that you're doing and are going to be doing and genuinely believing it to be true. I'm like, what? what? I'm, I'm just like, I'm flabbergasted by it. And every right. once in a while, I'm like, is it me? Like, am I the one who just has it wrong? I'm a big Taylor Swift fan. And so I'm just hearing, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. I didn't know that was her song. But yeah. What? Dude, I didn't know. She, I, look, listen, okay. the way That's I see fair. it, Travis Kelsey put Taylor Swift on the map. Oh, <laughs> so but we you talk do, about that offline. <laughs> do, 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 do you follow me though? Do you follow me on this? Yes. It's like, I, yes, you know, I, I'm in this. I I explained it to somebody recently. Sometimes building active life feels like we are trying to prove that you can, in fact, climb a greased pole. Right. I believe you can. We're yeah. like we're look we're getting a little higher, but we're also getting really dirty. And every once in a while, I'm like, is it just me? And then I have to go into the internal thoughts of, here's all the evidence that it's not just you. Right, right. One of my favorite quotes um, is, in God we trust, all others must, must bring data. And so when I feel myself spiraling into, I'm not even good at this, or am I cut out for this? Do I have the capacity to make X? Like, yes, you absolutely do. And here is the data. What's there the data? Are, um, I would not be paid what I'm paid a class at the big box gym mm -hmm. if I were trash. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not have people willing to follow me outside of their uh, local bubble to do really low level fitness if I was not good at this. Um, I would not... I wouldn't still be doing it, mm -hmm. frankly, like with as self-critical as I tend to be, if I weren't actually truly good at this on, even on a bad day, I would have not, I would have stopped a long time ago. When you say you're self-critical, how are you self-critical? Um, I think, especially in a, in a CrossFit or CrossFit ad adjacent space, a coach can get really hung up on, well, I'm not able to do everything at the highest level as an athlete. Um, of as an athlete. Correct. And so I'm no bueno as a coach and the two don't correlate. Um, I think somebody who is a really, really high level athlete maybe could be a good coach, mm -hmm. but it's not a prerequisite. Um, the th only thing that's really important to me between the two is does coach move as well as they are asking me to move mm -hmm. and if not pass <laughs> okay so there's a lot there there's a lot there do you have experience in the crossfit space i do yes okay that's where i started okay so you have experience in the CrossFit space working with the CrossFit client, and you have experience working with the CrossFit adjacent client in the big box. My first question is, are those different people, or are they the same, are they the same person in a different location? Um, they are different people. What's different about them? Because effectively, the way I'm understanding it, a big box gym opens a CrossFit gym inside, doesn't pay affiliate fees, doesn't want to be associated, but they're effectively running a CrossFit mm -hmm. gym. Sometimes. Maybe. Well, so at, at generally the type of person that comes to me at the big box gym um, is less concerned about what everybody around them is doing. Why do you think that is? Because I think people hear CrossFit and they have a certain mental association to it. They think fire breather, even if that's not necessarily true. And so it, somebody generally doesn't walk in off the street without already into, knowing. Into CrossFit or into the big box? Into CrossFit. Mm -hmm. People will walk into the big box 
I see. Often. Is that because they feel like it's a part of what they're already paying a membership for and it must yeah. just be a normal thing? Right. It feels less exclusive. Are you doing the same Olympic lifts and gymnastics? Um, much less gymnastics. Still some Olympic lifts, but a lot of the time when Olympic lifts are programmed, um, it's going to be with dumbbells or with kettlebells okay. over with the bar, um, unless it's in a strength. Okay. Okay. What do you enjoy? Like, why did you get into coaching? Um, hmm. Why did I get into coaching? Um, the answer that I'd give you now is very different from what I would tell you then. Well, tell me, um, what, tell me what you would have told me then. And then tell me what you would tell me now. And then you can share with me why it changed. So back then, I think it was equal parts. I am fascinated by this. And I want to learn as much as possible about like how to get better at this thing. Mm -hmm. And also powered by some self-esteem, self-consciousness, fueled from being told uh, in college that I'd never be athletic. Mm -hmm. um, so told you that? like uh, a boyfriend who relatively quickly became an ex. Kick him in the balls first. No, I wish I wish <laughs> I was not. I did not. All the audacity that I have now, I did not have then. I forget the movie. I forget <laughs> what movie it was. Um, all I can remember is from the movie, they would kick the guy in the balls and be like, you know why. <laughs> I forget what movie it is. Though. I can see the scene. It's oh, like, gosh, what is that from? Is it Cameron Diaz and Ashton Kutcher? Is that the movie? I think it is. But I my, think that's my, true. My wife and I will joke around in the house and be like, you know why. And I'm like, you Dude, Know do, why? Do not kick me in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> um, then my three-year-old, my four-year-old, everyone's going to be like, "I'll kick you in the balls." I'm like, "I'll, I'll beat the crap out of you." I'm like, "Daddy, <laughs> Daddy will, Daddy will make sure you always remember the day you kicked him in the balls." If yeah. you do that, yeah. she did it one day anyway, and I, I hit her. Like, I mean, I didn't closed hand hit my four-year-old, but I basically palmed her hard enough to knock her down. Mm. And she was like, what was that for? I'm like, you know why. You know, you know why. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, you back then you were fascinated by the coaching of it. Yes. And, and now? And now I'm less fascinated with the method and with the process and more with the outcome. Okay. And How I'm, I'm less interested in somebody just being really good at fitness for the sake of fitness. I am really interested in them being excellent at life because of what we've done to their fitness and their wellness. When was, when did that change? Uh, when I had kids. Why do you think that is? Um, because I'll tell you a story. Um, so when I was pregnant with Walt, he is four years old now. Mm -hmm. um, shortly before I became pregnant with him, that's a very passive way to say that, before we conceived, um, I took a birth fit course to become more uh, well-rounded as a prenatal and postpartum coach, mm -hmm. um, specifically wanting to help one of my athletes who was about 12 weeks pregnant modify. Mm -hmm. And, hey, I want to keep her. She asked me, how can I keep doing this safely? And I didn't know what to tell her. And I was infuriated by that. So I went and I took this birth fit course. And uh, about a year later, I got pregnant with Walt. And I remember um, that there was one coach at our gym who he was always the coach when I took class. And he would often ask me, what are you doing today? And I would watch his eyes glaze over while I answered him. Mm -hmm. And that is about the time that I decided, okay, I don't know that this for the purpose of this is what I want to be doing anymore. Like that's when he was like, you need to be doing toast to bar. And you're like, dude, 
Right. <laughs> or or he'd he'd ask me, you know, like, why are you doing the functional progressions instead of um like ab mat sit ups? And I'd try to explain to him, like, hey, you are a coach too. Mm-hmm. You should care about this because probably you're gonna encounter another pregnant person. Right. And, and it was just like I don't know, because my abs are like an open zipper right now. Right. <laughs> um and he was not interested at all in learning about like why are you doing that mm-hmm. well <laughs> so, so so what what about i want you to talk to the crossfit coach now because mm-hmm. let's be honest functional fitness adjacent to crossfit it's the same person mm-hmm. the, i'm not talking about the client i'm talking about the coach sure right. uh, yes. it, it might it might be somebody who feels a certain way like I'm a little bit more elevated or whatever. And sometimes Mm -hmm. they're right. And sometimes they're just an idiot. But what would you say to the CrossFit coach today about the skill set that they have, if they haven't gone and gotten additional skill sets in terms of their ability to service a group class in a group class way consistently? Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask is, if you coach CrossFit, you're going to mm-hmm. coach somebody who either is pregnant or was pregnant in the last mm-hmm. six months. You're going yep. to coach somebody who's either diabetic or pre-diabetic. You're going to coach somebody who's hypertensive. You're going to coach somebody who's taken water pills. You're going to coach somebody who's on cholesterol medication. And now, mm-hmm. those change things. Right. What would you say to them? Um, I would say, I know that your intentions are good, but you may be unintentionally doing harm. How? And by suggesting well-meaning modifications that maybe are not appropriate for that person. And it's not, it's not out of malice. Mm -hmm. It's just, there are things you don't know. Can you give me one very specific example? Uh, yes. Um, I, when I was pregnant, was advised to do uh, kipping knee raises instead of toast bar. And why is that not good? Um, because it's not appropriate for us to do anything that opens the diastasis recti more. Like, my body is already working hard enough to break the core apart. We don't need to help. Mm-hmm. So what would be a better, what would be a better modification for that? Um, something that is going to help our breath control, not put our low backs in a, in a bad state. So I really like a dead bug or maybe even a bare plank, uh, with a shoulder tap, Mm -hmm. um, depending on how far along we are, maybe we need to do something seated. Um, I love, um, Dr. Erica Boland's functional progression series, mm-hmm. um, which is excellent for postpartum healing as now, well. H- how do you answer the woman now who says, mm-hmm. Wheezy, we're not weak just because we're pregnant. Stop minimizing what I can do and telling me that I can't do these things. I'm a woman. I'm strong. I'm mm-hmm. building a baby. I can do all the things. Right. We're saying the same things. And what I'm asking you to do or not do is not necessarily harmful to you, but it's just the stage of life that your body is in right now. And I want you to emerge stronger a year from now. What makes you say I wouldn't emerge stronger if I don't do what you say? Hmm. You, you go, you are, you are potentially your, your body is working hard enough to open that zipper. Mm-hmm. Let's not make it harder to close So in a year. When you want to get back to these things that you enjoy and that you like doing and this level of fis- fitness that you've become accustomed to, I want to get you back there as quick as possible. The way that you're trying to go is not the way. So what I, what I believe is a problem for the coach that becomes really difficult is the tiptoeing of the line between... Right. You're not able to do this and you're able to do this and you might not have a negative result as a result of doing it. Right. But you might. 
and you can get the outcome that you're looking for doing things that don't carry that risk. Right. Exactly. That's, I think that that takes a lot of understanding of the mm-hmm. anatomy for the coach and then a lot of self-worth to be able to hold that space. Right. And then a lot of communication skills to be able to articulate. I'm, I agree with you. Right. You probably well, can. And part of, part of what has to go into that is that we already have to have trust established, right? Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't say that to somebody who's coming to my class for the very first time. Why not? I think you need to. Let me rephrase that. I, part of, part of what is important then is that I am actually living out the values that I've defined, Mm -hmm. that I am presenting myself a certain way in class. I'm not rolling in 10, 15 minutes late with a cup of coffee and my hair frazzled and a stain on my shirt, right? I am, I am earning your trust from moment one. Mm -hmm. And I am also learning from the cues that you are giving me as to how I need to communicate with you. And I am trying not to minimize what you think you're capable of and what I believe to be safe and appropriate for you and utilizing a lot of can versus should. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So if we come back now, to the education you're going through with us because I have one Mm -hmm. or two more questions that I'm curious about. If you were on our sales team Mm -hmm. and we were to say, Wheezy, you're in your second month of ALP. When you enrolled, it wasn't financially comfortable. You were able to do it, but you weren't like, oh yeah, Mm -hmm. just no big deal. Let's just throw this money out. Um, Mm -hmm. And you were at that point, eight weeks postpartum. Mm -hmm. what makes somebody a fit to enroll in ALP regardless of their current financial situation? Who, like, who would you say on the phone? I understand all of your objections. They're all valid. Mm -hmm. And I'm recommending you enroll anyway. Um, somebody who is, interested in changing actual lives as opposed to the rush of a three, two, one go. Um, somebody who is maybe exasperated by modifying for folks, even if it's the best mod in the world. Um, but you're not solving this person's problem. Um, and you have the willingness to admit that you don't know everything that is the right person. And if you were that person, which you were, how Mm -hmm. would you recommend I message it? What are the things I need to be saying so that the people in that boat can hear me Mm. as their advocate instead of their judge? Well, actually, um, something that you said I kept kind of coming back to, so I'll share that with you. Um, It was a probing question to the tune of if money is what is in the way, but you believe this to actually be able to give you the tools that you need to make for X what you were paying in, how do you make it happen to do that as quickly as possible? Like, you know, you believe that this will give you those tools. How do we get you there to be 2X, 4X mm-hmm. sooner? Well, that's that's well and good if they have a financial problem. Right. I'm, I'm thinking about, like, that part for me, <clears throat> I don't want to say that's easy, but that's the part that I'm most comfortable with. Sure. <clears throat> the part for me that's uncomfortable is when somebody says, I think I can already do that. And I'm like, that's only because you haven't learned how to do it. 
and and you don't know what you don't know and and you yeah. have great intentions and you're a great person and I could litigate this with you and go through all of the people who you've been working with who have not gotten the result that you're telling me you can consistently get. Mm. And you would have a good reason. And you really would. There would be a good reason for why every single one of them didn't get the result. But right. in the end, the question would be, if you were a better communicator, if you were more empathetic, if you had a different skill set, would you have been able to salvage a percentage of the people who sabotaged themselves? And the answer to that is yes. So now the question is, how important is it for you to be able to help that percentage of right. people? But where I get stuck is the number of people who believe that they are doing the same thing or something very similar blows my mind. Yeah. And I want to, what I want to do is say, you only think that because you have no idea what you're talking about. Right. The average client who walks into the flagship gets recommended over 60 personal training sessions before we start considering individual program design for them. Six, zero. They're paying mm. over $150 for each of those sessions. You believe that same person can get served in a group environment. One of us... Yeah, it's not possible. Well, 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 it's not possible for both of us to be correct. Right. So the question is, how do I help the person who today thinks that person can be served in a group, but is frustrated that they're not making the progress yet? Because it can't be the person who's like, mm. they can get there in the group, you're an idiot. Okay, fine. Like, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. But there's a person right. who's been coaching group and their thought is, I'm just not good enough at coaching group yet because this can happen. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not you. It's the model. Right. How do I talk to that person? I think speaking to that person about what client onboarding looks like would be a good place to start. How do you decide um, on that kind of stuff? Right. How do you how do you know that that person is an appropriate fit for your group class anyway? And the answer, I would wager, ninety five percent of the time is, well, they showed up. Mm -hmm. But then we don't know anything else about them. We don't know what their goals are. We don't know what their restrictions are. We don't know how they're sleeping. Um, what their stress looks like at work. And so, yes, those are some pieces that you can find out as a part of just like talking to your athletes in a class. However, at the end of the day, you know, you're not, they are going through a full movement assessment. Even if you're doing like a CrossFit onboarding or a 101, you're not getting into the nitty gritty of why their body moves the way that it moves, where its limitations are, and then how you address that in a very personal way to make their life outside of the gym better. The counter argument to that would be, you don't need to do all of that. That's why I don't do it. And I think that that's where this thing could possibly just come mm. to a close. So, right. so we don't need to keep going down that rabbit hole. I have one more question for you, and then I'm going to open the floor and ask you if there's anything I didn't ask you about that you think would be useful for people to know about you okay. or anything. Um, you enrolled seven, eight weeks ago, you said, right? Something like that? Yes, that's right. Okay. Have you gotten any new clients since enrolling? Like you said, you, 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 uh, you spoke about it earlier, but I wasn't sure if that was hypothetical, theoretical, or if you've actually met people who you then sold services to who are happy mm -hmm. that they bought who you wouldn't have been able to sell before. Yes. Um, I had a client uh, sign on with me three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, For what service? She has signed into individual program design, but with personal training sessions up front. What are you paying? What are, what are they paying for that? Um, she is paying a hundred dollars a session, okay. um, which is like a mid range tier. That's not my top tier pricing. That's not my low tier pricing either. Um, but knowing that she is going to roll into individual design from there, 
which is going to cost her what? $250 a month. Okay. Um, we might need to step that up a little bit. 250 cents. I know. I know. My, my median income is on the low end here mm-hmm. in our zip code. What is but, the median income? Um, in my zip code, it's just under 45. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll take a look at that calculator for the, the rainbow <laughs> program design. Uh, cause I think that that needs to be higher. The, what's your low end? What's your high end? You said that's in the middle. Um, so my high end uh, is going to be 134 mm-hmm. a session, and then uh, my lowest end, I think, off the top of my head, is 74. But that's if somebody buys um, a 60 pack. Okay. Okay. Not bad. Not bad for two months, and I'll take it. Not bad. Um, and then I had another consult on Monday um, that we have a follow up call, at which I expect a yes, let's go mm-hmm. uh, on Friday. Very nice. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Is there, is there anything I didn't ask you about that you think would be useful for people to know? Um, I don't think we talked about if it's actually doable in a schedule of somebody who doesn't have a lot of free time. Well, I wasn't looking for a full-blown pitch for Active Light Professional, but I'm happy to have you share it. Go for it. Um, so this was a, it was a reservation that I had. Um, am I going to have the time to commit to evolving in this kind of robust way? And so far, it's been extremely manageable, um, even having a job, a household to run, and two very young children. Um it's been extremely doable to still make enough strides to feel like I'm progressing my skill set, but then also signing new clients. Is that because you're extremely well managed? Or is that because another reason? Um, I think I'm well managed, but part of the like framework for getting started with ALP is taking a hard look at what your time looks like and deciding when am I going to do this mm-hmm. scheduling. And so, first. right. Correct. You were going to say something and I cut you off. <laughs> Just making that commitment to, okay, this is when I am studying and I am blocking my calendar to do it. And it doesn't have to be 15 hours a week. I just need to scope out, you know, four 30 minute blocks or mm-hmm. two hour blocks and I can still be doing enough that I am getting better. Yeah. It's, it's about the speed with which you grow. And you're saying right. it's okay to move a little bit slower to accommodate the life that you're living. You're still moving right. forward. You're making the progress that you wouldn't have made otherwise. And the results right. are better than the, than the cost. Right. Better enough to say no to an opportunity that looks pretty exceptional on paper. That's true. We, <laughs> Weezy, where can people find you if they want to learn more? Um, so you can find me at my website, which is www.wildweez.com, which sounds very infomercial, but mm-hmm. I love it. It's kitschy. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram, Coach Weez. Okay. And if people are listening to this and they want to ask you questions about ALP, are you open to them sending you DMs? Of course. Okay. Weezy Shoemaker, thank you for joining us on the Active Light Podcast. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Light Podcast. Please remember... Give us a hand, rate it, review it wherever you listen to shows. We are on a mission to humanize the healthcare industry by professionalizing the fitness industry to empower the individual to live a life unlimited by the way that their body looks, feels, or performs. If you are inspired by that mission and want to jump on the wagon, find us anywhere. Active Life Professional on Instagram. Active Life RX on Instagram. Come to me personally at Dr. Sean Pastuch. We want to welcome you onto the train. We want you to be a part of the mission. We want to offer you the opportunity to pursue this right alongside us. We're inspired by your effort, and we hope to help you in your journey. Turn pro.